Hi everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this Trying to Conceive webinar as part of our Fertility Week event. Now today's focus is hashtag men matter. So this webinar explores facts, issues, terminology about sperm and male factor infertility, the main cause of infertility actually. So it slots in really, really neatly to that focus for this week. Now our guest panelist tonight is Professor Sheena Lewis and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome her. Welcome Sheena. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> Lovely. Sheena's gonna tell you a little bit more about her role but she's highly regarded with many published papers on the subject of male infertility. So I know you're in really, really safe hands tonight. Sheena's presentation will come first tonight and then we'll move on to our short Q&A session as normal. Any questions that you might have, you can type as you go along and we will revisit them once Sheena's finished. Now, of course, we don't want you to disclose any of your um, personal information and this session will be recorded and watched by others later. So if you do ask a question, please make sure that you select the anonymous function. So all you have to do to ask a question is you take your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, a toolbar should appear, click on Q&A and a box will come up where you can type in your question as you go. Okay, Sheena, I'm gonna disappear now. Have fun. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Right, let's see if we can get this to work. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to talk to you. Um, I hear there are quite a few people who are on this webinar, so um, ask me all the questions that you like, because I've been working in this area for 25 years, and I'm absolutely passionate about it. I think that men have been excluded from, um, from lots of the investigations that they probably should have had. And that's probably because reproduction has always been thought of as a female factor. We've always been female focused. But of course, we do know now that male fertility is one of the biggest issues. And in the past, we thought you know, everything was to do with the woman. And if the man could produce sperm, it would probably be OK. But now we have a much greater understanding that the quality of sperm, as well as the number of sperm that the man produces, are really important in terms of getting pregnant and having a healthy baby. So for the next 20 minutes or an hour or 20 minutes, I'm going to chat for it. I know there are lots and lots of you there, and I know that you've got lots of questions, so I won't talk for too long so that we will have an opportunity to answer your questions as well. But let's talk about sperm for a while. The sperm is absolutely unique. It's not like any other cell in the body. All of the other cells can do lots and lots of different functions and they can fix themselves, they can repair themselves if anything goes wrong with their DNA. But the sperm is totally different because in order to make itself very small and make itself able to swim, it only has a large head with DNA in it, no repair mechanisms and a tail so that it can swim the very, very long journey to get to the egg. And if any of you want to know how long the journey is for the sperm to reach the egg and fertilize it, it's equivalent of any of us running 40 miles. And when we run 40 miles, then we have to do the most amazing thing that we've been made for, and that is to fertilize the egg. Now, how many of us could do that? I used to ask my medical students this, how many of you can run 40 miles? There'd always be one smart person who thought he could, and then everybody else in the class would laugh at him. Talking about marathons, I just want to explain to you a little bit of simple physiology of how the sperm is made and then that's where things can go wrong sometimes and how far it has to go to get to the egg. <clears throat> so we've got four pictures on the, on the screen. Look at the first one. I know it's very, very complicated, but all I want you to know is that the sperm are made in the testes and they go through lots and lots of different stages from the top to the bottom. You can see they start off as uh, purple brown cells like every other cell and then when they go down at the bottom you can see the little blue sperm with the long tails. That's only the beginning. When they're then released from the testes they, um, as you can see in the second picture, that's a picture of the testes and then you can see that there's a very very complicated 
twisted um, long tube. And that's called the epididymis. And that's where a lot of damage happens actually to sperm because there's some old sperm there. And as the new sperm goes through, they can get um, mixed up. I don't know if you've heard of free radicals. Sometimes you take antioxidants to combat the free radicals. Well, that's where the free radicals are lurking in the epididymis. So in the third picture, you can see that the man has an erection at this stage, but the sperm have got to go all the way from the testes through all those complicated uh, tubes and then uh, through the penis to get to the, the woman's body. And then the final picture, when the, the sperm actually get into the vagina, which you can see at the bottom of the fourth picture, then they have to swim all the way up through the endometrium and right out to the end of the, uh, the, the pink tube at the top that look like two handles. And that's where fertilization occurs. So you can understand that is why sperm need to have really good motility and I'm sure a lot of people have been told that their sperm are not very good at swimming, but that's why they need to be good swimmers because it's such a long journey for them. Now, as I was saying earlier, until last year, believe it or not, we have always thought that female infertility was the biggest cause of a, pro a couple's problems. But last year, the HFEA came out with this statistic showing that the most common reasons for IVF treatment were male fertility, male infertility, and then secondly, unexplained infertility. Now, I'm quite sure there are people listening tonight who have been given a diagnosis of idiopathic or unexplained infertility. And that is such a frustrating thing to be told. We know you have a problem, but we don't know what it is. It's very complicated and, and uh, frustrating for the doctor, and it's very frustrating for the patient as well, because when you go to the doctor, you want the doctor to tell you, number one, what's wrong with you, and number two, how he or she are going to fix it. And if you're told you've got unexplained infertility, then that's not very helpful. And I know a lot of people would come to, to me and say, the doctor said there was nothing wrong with us. Well, that's not actually what they said. They said it was unexplained, so they didn't know what was wrong with you. But of course, you know that there's a problem, because otherwise you would be able to have the, the family that you want so much. So what can go wrong? What is it that causes um, such problems for sperm? Well, I think there are, there are basically three things. And if you look in the first, uh, the first column here, what the problem is, the production line fails or slows down. And that is really when you're told you've got a low sperm count or a low sperm concentration. Things have gone wrong, so the sperm haven't actually been produced. The second thing that can happen is when the sperm are going down that very long tube, I was talking about the epididymis, they don't mature properly and then they come out the other end and they are a funny shape. They're not the shape they ought to be. And that's when you're told that your sperm have got poor morphology. And then the third thing that can go wrong is if the sperm don't mature properly, they can't swim. Now, as I was showing you, the sperm have a very long way to swim uh, in order to reach the egg to fertilize it. And if they can't swim very well, then that's why fertilization doesn't occur. So if you're told that you've got poor sperm motility, that's because they're not swimming properly. And then the, the, the final thing there, if you can hear noises in the background, it's because it's Halloween. And I think there must be some children's houses quite near my office here. And I can hear bangs as fireworks go off. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but if you can, don't panic. So the last thing that can happen is if the sperm don't mature properly, they can have DNA damage. And that is where you are told sometimes in clinics that you've got DNA fragmentation or a high DFI. And of course, it's the DNA of the man's sperm that make a child look and act like him. So it's really important that he's got good DNA quality. Now, because there are lots of people who are given um, a diagnosis of unexplained infertility, that means that the there are no detectable uh, problems with the woman and no detectable problems with the man, then they, um, they usually go for IVF. And sometimes that doesn't work either, as you know, the success rates are um, between 20 and 30%. So what I would suggest is that when couples are given a diagnosis of unexplained or idiopathic infertility, the men have further investigations to check out what, if there's anything else that's wrong with them. 
very, very often, if a man has normal semen analysis, he is not offered any further tests. And there's certainly a lot of research that's been done to show that even though the sperm count might be okay, the motility might be okay, the morphology might be okay, there still can be DNA damage or oxidative stress from uh, free radicals. And it's only when you go to see a doctor who specializes in men's reproductive health that you will get the investigations that he needs. What will happen then if you go to see a urologist is he will do a detailed history of the man. And maybe he had mumps when he was a child and that has led to low sperm counts. Maybe he's got a varicocele, and a varicocele is just like a, a varicose vein on the scrotum or on the testes. And that's found very, very commonly in something like up to 40% of men who have um, infertility problems, they've got varicoceles. And those can be repaired just the way uh, people have varicose veins repaired, and that's an outpatient. And within three months of repair, the sperm quality can become much better. Another thing you'll see I've mentioned here is chronic pelvic pain. Lots of men have got chronic pel pelvic pain, like low back pain, and they just say, oh, it's very uncomfortable, but they don't go to the doctor. I mean, this is something women are very keen on going to doctors if there's something uh, not right. Men don't. And very often, low pelvic pain is caused by prostatitis. The prostate gland is another part of the, the male anatomy, which is really important in producing uh, good, healthy sperm. And prostatitis can be um, uh, resolved and cured with antibiotics. Now, the one, two, three, four, the fifth one down is anabolic steroids. And this has become very much um, a topic for discussion over the last few years because lots of men take protein shakes when they go to the gym. And no one has thought that that does anything more than building wonderful muscles and making a man look really fit. But the problem is anabolic steroids or protein shakes quite often have these steroids which actually impair sperm production. So although a man might think he's getting bigger and better, he can actually be doing something which is damaging to his fertility. Uh, bacterial infections, lots of men have infections. We see lots of semen samples that have um, uh, uh, blood in them or, or um, round cells which are an indication of infections. Again, those can be um, resolved with antibiotics. And poor diet. Lots of people like myself eat calorie rich but um, nutrient poor food. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what I'm really saying to you tonight is we need to focus on couple care. Not just looking after the woman but looking after the man. And one of the ways we can look after the man is to make his sperm as good as we possibly can before he goes for treatment. Now, the treatments for the man, IVF, as you know, same as for the woman, but usually ICSI is the one for a man if he has poor sperm count, poor motility, poor morphology. And if that doesn't work, then the, the third type of treatment which has come in over the last five years is to do ICSI with testicular sperm. Now I know for all you men listening, that's making you cross your legs and uh, tears come out of your eyes. But actually it's not as bad as it sounds. And um, it can be done on an, an outpatient basis. Lots and lots of anesthesia, of course, so it doesn't hurt. And a tiny, tiny biopsy the size of a grain of rice is taken from the testis. And when this is um, all teased out in the lab, you can get lots of sperm from just one biopsy. And then that can be used in ICSI. Because if ICSI fails with ejaculated sperm, then until recently, the only alternative was to go for donor sperm. And of course, donor sperm, while it's a very, very good way of going forward to have your family, it means that the child is not biologically related to um, his or her dad. Now, the other things that you can have, and maybe if you've been on the HFEA website, you've seen the section on add-ons. And I'm on the HFEA SCAT committee, so we look at all the add-ons and see whether we're going to give them uh, red, amber, or green in traffic lights and to see whether they're good or bad. Now, some of the ones that are there are sperm DNA damage tests, and those will show you the quality of the DNA. And as I was saying, DNA quality is a really important parameter for men. 
Pixie is another one, and that's one where um, the sperm are put into a little petri dish in the lab, which is covered with a, a sticky fluid of, it's called hyaluronidase. And the sperm that stick there can then be picked off and used in the ICSI treatment. And that's been shown um, in some uh, studies to reduce miscarriages for those who've been unfortunate enough to get pregnant with IVF or ICSI, but they um, have unfortunately miscarried. Microfluidics are another test which are coming into uh, the, la the labs and clinics now. And this is just like an obstacle course that the sperm have to swim through. And the, the design is that the, the best sperm will swim out the other end, and those are the ones that will be used in your treatment. And then finally, I'm sure many of you have been offered antioxidant supplements uh, from clinics. And this is to combat the free radicals, which we know um, men can have within uh, their, their epididymis or can have um, in, in the semen. So another thing I, I thought you might be interested in is the um, association between men and miscarriage. And again, this is a very, very novel um, discovery because until 2012, we didn't know there was really a relationship. And in 2012, I was a, a co-author on a, a big review paper where we took all the studies that have been done on men and the quality of their sperm and whether or not their partners had miscarried. And we found that there was a very uh, strong association. In fact, if the men had really high DNA damage in their sperm, it doubled the chance of the couple having a miscarriage. And as a result of that, I was then also the co-author of the European guidelines, which came out in 2018, or 2017, it says there. And this is all about recurrent pregnancy loss. People who uh, ha either get pregnant um, spontaneously, didn't have fertility treatment, or people who had fertility treatment and then had, unfortunately, had a, a, a pregnancy loss. And this is talking about how it's good uh, clinical practice to have this, the men's sperm tested to see what the quality is like. So um, I'm not going to talk for too much longer, but I just wanted to talk about some of the sperm friends and some of the sperm enemies that we have in our, our everyday lives. Healthy diets is one. We're going to talk about that in more detail in a moment. Exercise is really good. Very good to keep fit. Very good to stay calm. Very good to relax. Exercise is good for all of us. And I've got my Fitbit on and I'm trying to make sure I do my 10,000 steps today. No gym supplements, no anabolic steroids, no protein shakes. We've talked about that. And moderate drinking. Binge drinking has been shown not to be good. But I think it's, it's very foolish. And there was a paper that was um, published a few months ago and I was uh, speaking for the Science Media Center and it was in all of the, 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 the papers and it was talking about consumption of alcohol. And this paper was saying a man should stop drinking, completely stop uh, and for six months before they were, you know, they were trying to conceive. And I said, I thought that was wrong. There's no evidence whatsoever that moderate drinking is, um, is going to impair a man's fertility. And by that, I mean um, two or three glasses of wine. And I think, it's, I think we have to take everything in moderation because it's very stressful, as you know, going through fertility treatment. It's difficult. It's very difficult to maintain the relationship between a couple. It, it's, it's just a high pressure place to be. And to say people, oh, you must n not drink anything and you, you, know, you, you mustn't do all the things you like and you must uh, just be absolutely like a saint for three months or six months, it just can't be done. So we've just got to think about caring for each other and leading a moderate lifestyle. So if you look down the right, you look at the things we like to eat and eat too many of. And if you look on the left, then you can see the things we should be eating. And there's no doubt that um, eating fruit and veg and protein and home cooked foods with no additives is the very best way to get your antioxidants into your body. Eating too, too much salt, eating too much fat, eating highly processed foods, all of these things are not good for us. And really, the, the simple thing to say is anything that's uh, good for your body is good for your sperm. Really, the things that, the things that, that everyone is telling us in terms of eating a, a healthy diet 
are the ones on the left and they're good for our, our everyday general health and they're also good for our sperm. These are the ones that aren't so good and unfortunately you can see that there are quite a lot of them. If we go from the left, um, we know the effects of alcohol can actually um, cause impotence but the other effects of drinking too much are that they can um, reduce sperm motility and that is if, you know, binge drinking, going out and drinking you know, 10 pints on a Friday evening really isn't too good for you. The next one down, smoking. Smoking, I would say, is probably the worst of all, and that's smoking tobacco. Tobacco is known to have about 40 different toxins, all of them really bad for us. They create oxidative stress, they damage our, our cells in our body, they damage our sperm. Next one, long, guys, far too overweight. He really is. And if he were trying to become a dad, uh, the very first thing any healthcare professional would say to him is lose weight. The next one over is sexually transmitted infections. And there's, there's no doubt that there's a relationship between sexually transmitted infections and infertility. And I always used to, to, to say to my, my medical students, you know, you're in your early 20s now and you think that sex is fun, as many partners as you like, and that's, there will be no consequences. And I say to them, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And if you keep up that sort of behavior, then you could very well be um, the couples who are looking for fertility uh, treatment in your, in, your, in your 30s. Viagra, again, not good for sperm motility. Um, it makes the sperm go very, very quickly for a very short time, and then they experience burnout. And we have published papers on that. Um, next one across on the, the top right is the, the man who's super fit on the outside, but um, he hasn't done his sperm any good. And the one below is cannabis. And again, we have published papers on that. And it's funny, cannabis and, and Viagra have the exact opposite effects. Viagra makes the sperm go really, really quickly and then they are exhausted. And the cannabis chills the sperm so that they just swim round in circles Maniana, don't do too much. Just the same effects as um, cannabis has on people, it has on sperm. So that's really all I have to say. I don't want to talk for too long because I know you want to ask me questions, but my big message, and I'll be talking to uh, the press and talking to the media a number of times over the next few days, is let's make male fertility central stage because it has been in the background and we have done men a disservice and it's really time that we began to think about men and how we can improve their fertility as well as women's. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheena, for your presentation. That was really, really interesting there and lots of questions have come through already. Um, I've got a few that were sent to me before the webinar began. Um, the first one is, now, is it okay to cycle for a man before he has to give his um, sperm sample into the clinic? Is it all right for him to, to cycle? Or is it all right for men to cycle generally when they're preparing for IVF anyway? Yeah, well, th this is a very interesting question because... We always say exercise is really good, but the one type of exercise which has been shown not to be so good is cycling. But we really are talking much more about endurance cycling. I don't think cycling a few miles a day is going to do anyone any harm. But the reasons why a lot of cycling, and sort of marathon or endurance um, training, well, we, we don't know what the reasons are to be honest, but there are several reasons that could be um, associated. One is, um, if you can imagine the man's anatomy, all of the nerves which lead to the penis are right down um, where the saddle is touching. And it may be that the actual uh, nerves can be damaged um, by, by cycling. Second thing is lycra is extremely warm and we don't think that getting the testes too warm is good for them. In fact, we know it's not because that's why the testes are outside the body. So that they stay two degrees colder than all the organs that are in our abdomens. So if you put on super hot lycra or tight lycra, it's really, really warm, then you're not going to do your sperm any good. So those are the two things that are, would suggest that a long-term cycling is not so good. But if it's something you like, if it's something that relaxes you, 
and you're only doing a few miles, I would think that's fine. Okay, the second one was, um, what is the best food to eat, which I think you've pretty much covered in the presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, uh, I'm just going to add a bit more to that. And are there any supplements that you think men should take? Well, the, the vitamins, which we know, um, you know, vitamins A, A, C, E, particularly C and E, we know are really important. Um, so that's, um, you can get them over the counter. Uh, I don't think there's anything particularly special about them. We know that selenium is very good. We know that calcium is very good. We know that sperm needs zinc. So those are a few things, but they're all in the basic, uh, basic vitamins that you can get anywhere, really. Um, but as I say, you can get them also in food, and I think it's probably better to get them that way because not only do we need vitamins, but with the vitamins that you get in food, there are cofactors which are linked in if you eat your vitamins through fruit or veg. And the vitamins work much better if they're with the natural cofactors. So the best way to get them into your body, to present them to uh, your sperm, is uh, by the natural means. Okay, and there was one other question which we talked a little bit about before, which was um, somebody who would like to know if they need to do further investigations into um, the partner's very low sperm count. Um, hormone testing showed that there were high FSH levels and high testosterone, which is very unusual to have both, isn't it? Which mm -hmm. your doctors can't explain. However, there is no more offer of further investigations on the table and not a huge amount of information online. They've got one shot at ICSI in six months time. But as I say, they just want to know if they, if they need to investigate further before then for, for other possible causes. Well, I would, I would think that that was a perfect example of a man who should go and see a urologist because the urologist will talk him through his history, examine him, and he will talk him through all the possibilities of maybe he's got a varicocele, maybe he's got an infection. There are lots of very simple things that could be done to help. And even if there is one shot in six months' time, use these six months to get your sperm really at their best because the the better the health of the sperm when you have your treatment, the better your chances are going to be. Okay, let's have a look at some of the questions. Can I ask, just does anyone know a urologist or will they look online or do they want advice on this or what ought they to do about that? Um, I think pro possibly if they went to see their GP, their GP would be able to refer okay. them, wouldn't they? Okay. I think that would probably be the, the best way. Um, and generally, or maybe even um, IVF clinic might be able to tell them because they're very yes. closely linked, as you say. So there are some there are some clinics uh, within London certainly who actually have urologists who work, you know, one one clinic a week. If anyone's going to the fertility show over the next few days, there are a couple of urologists who are actually speaking about men and male fertility. I'm at the fertility show too. If anybody wants to talk further to me, I'm going to be there. Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So you know what I look like. I'd be delighted to uh, to talk to you. I'm going to come and give you a hug there, Sheena. So I'll Yay! come and say hello. <laughs> okay. So um, does ICSI fully overcome lower IVF success rates caused by high DNA fragmentation levels? Oh, so my husband, there's a bit more information. My husband has a sperm comet average score of 60, a low score of four, and a high score of 79. And we wonder if we would have a higher chance of success using donor sperm. We've had three unsuccessful ICSI cycles so far. Oh, my heart breaks for you. That's just awful. I really feel for you. It's so, so upsetting to have several failures. Again, my advice would be to see a urologist because there is an issue there. I, I, from what I hear, I, I can hear that there's, um, there's DNA damage. Again, there are ways of making your sperm better. And if you were thinking of another cycle before you go down the donor route, I would definitely suggest you go and see a, a urologist and see if they can help to improve the quality of your sperm DNA. Okay, there's also, it, it, they added a bit more to that saying, um, it should have mentioned we've been diagnosed with male factor infertility, very low count and poor motility and morphology. But mm -hmm. as you say, um, 
probably it would still be going to see the uro urologist, wouldn't it? Well, I would think so. And it, it goes back to what I was talking about, about testicular sperm. I assume the three failed ICSI cycles were with ejaculated sperm. But quite often, um, urologists can do biopsies and get testicular sperm and use those in ICSI cycles. And I know there are a number of clinics in, in London who do that regularly. So that's, that's a possibility and might give you a much better chance of success in your fourth cycle. Okay. My husband had around 70% of antibodies anti-sperm. Some specialists told me it's the reason of our infertility and some say it's not enough to explain why it doesn't work for us. What's your thought on that, please? We have unexplained infertility. Yeah. Well, ICSI is it, well, it's probably more likely to work for someone who has high anti-sperm antibodies. But the problem is because you have a semen analysis which has not shown that there was a problem, you've been given this diagnosis of unexplained infertility and the routine treatment for unexplained infertility is IVF and not ICSI. But there are certainly some clinics that would look at that history and say IVF is not the way to go. ICSI is much more likely to be successful. Okay, I know we're moving through these questions really quickly, but there are quite a lot on here, and I thought mm -hmm. there would be. I did say that to you, Sheena, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've had a vasectomy done when I was 21 years old, now 38, and had a reversal two years ago. Mm -hmm. I have sperm, but it's low quality. We've tried IVF ICSI, which had failed. We're hoping to try again. However, we don't have high hopes. My question is, will the quality of my sperm be higher if taken from the source rather than given a sample from masturbation? And you've sort of covered that really, haven't you? But I'll, I'll let you. Um, yes, yes, I, I think you're right. Um, we actually published a paper quite a number of years ago um, showing that the length of time from vasectomy to vasectomy reversal was quite important and if it was over 10 years then the quality of sperm was low after um, a reversal and this of course is your case of 21 and 38 so yes I think the way to go to get the best sperm is to get them just as you say at the source and if you're going to go for ICSI anyway ICSI with a testicular biopsy again could be the way that would give you um, success now, there are, there are some clinics that do that and there are some clinics that don't do that. So it's a question of looking really online to, to have a look at the, the clinics that really do focus on men and have a urologist who works with them. And then they are more likely to, to talk through that with you. OK. Next question. Can the presence of a benign testicular tumour affect sperm production and count, etc.? The tumour has been removed. Hmm. I'm not going to give you a definitive answer on that because I'm not sure. If the tumour has gone and it was benign, I wouldn't have thought there was still a problem. And also, presumably there was a tumour only on one testis, so the other testis is probably functioning normally. Um, but again, I hate to say it, I'm saying the same thing for every single question. Go and see a urologist, because they're the ones who know exactly the answer to that for you. There are lots of them, <laughs> lots of them in, around London. I don't know what area you're in, but they're, um, they're, they're all over the country now. And I, I'll tell you what has happened over the last five years. Urologists, it's very funny because urologists um, are the guys who have spent their whole medical training looking after male reproduction. And until very recently, they did a lot of oncology and prostate cancers and testicular cancers and erectile dysfunction and all those sorts of things. And in the UK, they didn't really do fertility. Whereas if you went to America, the urologists were the ones who did fertility treatment for men. But over the last few years, urologists have now started to get into the whole area of male infertility. And I must say, I think it's great because now we have an opportunity for men to be investigated and treated and cared for as, as they should be. So that's why I'm so pro telling men to go and see a doctor who knows about men rather than expecting an obstetrician to do it because obstetricians have been trained to look after women and that's what they do extremely well but if you if you know you have a male issue go and see a urologist 
Well, this next question sort of um, it leads into that nicely as well, because this one talks very much about lots of tests done on the female, but not on the male. Yeah. Yeah. So we've experienced four miscarriages, already oh. had sperm analysis, previously part of GP referred test, which TTC. We were referred to recurrent miscarriage clinic, but no tests were done on the male at all, but lots on the female. When we asked, DNA test was mentioned, but advised it was a private test only. It is available on NHS and what, oh sorry, is it available on the no. NHS? And what other test could or should have been done on the male? Well, of, of all the things that we've looked at in terms of uh, semen and men and miscarriage, DNA is the only one that shows a relationship. There's not a relationship in any of the semen analysis parameters like sperm count, motility or morphology. So the DNA would be the one to look at. Now, again, you know, there, there, are, there are some doctors who, who think it's important. There are some doctors who don't think it's important. I'm not allowed to tell you which or which at the moment, but there certainly are some um, miscarriage clinics within London who are getting the men tested for DNA quality for every new appointment, for every new couple. That's how much they believe in it. So I think it is important. And what it can do is to give you a diagnosis. Again, we're back to this point. You know, if you have several miscarriages, it's heartbreaking. But to, for, for the doctor to tell you that they don't know what's wrong is even worse. And if you can find that there is an issue, even if you're told, well, yes, it could be because the man has got poor DNA, you, then you can do something about it. You can do some of the lifestyle things that I was talking about and see if you can improve the quality of your sperm before um, you try again. Okay, and that's very similar to this next question, which is where should we go for male factor testing? I've been offered nothing from the NHS. We're on our second round of IUI. Yeah, I think it's terrible. I think it's terrible that some of these, these new, um, new tests are not on the NHS. And, and with all the austerity that we have at the moment, there's less and less on the NHS. And it's very sad for couples, especially when success rates are quite low, um, to be told that they've got to go and pay for all these other things as well. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell things like this on, online, but the, if, if you want to find out about male problems and um, google it and there will be places in london where you can have specialized tests done for the man or go and see your urologist and he'll tell you where to go next um, but i think it's very important that you do do that because i have people phoning me and they've been through you know four miscarriages or five cycles of ICSI, and i'm saying well have you has the man been investigated no what or they or they've been for donor eggs and it hasn't worked and then we find that it was actually, you know, it was a male problem and the males have just hadn't been tested before they went. All that money plus the heartbreak and, you know, inadequate investigations in advance. Okay, and that actually answers the next one as well, which is the IVF clinics that don't have specialist fertility urologists, where would you recommend to go? And obviously it would be, as you were saying, um, you can find out clinics that actually specialise in, in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I can't say, really. You just have to look that up for yourself. I'm sorry, I can't talk to my fertility, fertility show. Okay. Okay, we've had multiple recurring miscarriages at the viability scan stage. Would you recommend we look at sperm DNA fragmentation? My husband has frozen sperm from a microtease. Mm -hmm. See if this could be playing a part. We're desperate and we'll be going for only one more cycle of IVF. Well, yes, I would. Yes, I would. Uh, it depends how many how many um, little ampules of sperm your, your husband has frozen, because obviously you want to protect those and keep them for, for, for clinical use. But if you had a, an extra little tube in your clinic, will know that. I think it probably would be a good idea to, to check out the DNA and see what quality it is. Okay. Now, these are really, really quite specific questions that you're answering tonight, Sheena. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a big demand for, for this type of information. Um, 
There's one here, somebody says they've been a male professional athlete for the last 10 years. Um, and I think you're going to tell them that this might be something that a urologist might answer um, because it does sound like that. And I do endurance training six days a week. I've also been diagnosed with a varicocele. Do oh. you believe this linked to my training? The varicocele to your training? Not necessarily, no. But, but, but if you're talking about varicocele and male infertility, yes, absolutely, definitely. Okay. So um, get it checked out. And of course you can have it repaired. I mean, again, as an outpatient um, treatment, you, you, can, you can have a varicocele repaired. And let me tell you the good news. The good news is that men make new sperm every three months. So if you had it repaired before Christmas, it could be that by the spring, your sperm quality will be much better because you'll be making new sperm. And the problem with the varicocele is it's like, I was saying this varicose vein, and it's actually very warm. So what happens is that the sperm are getting too hot as they're being um, made, and then they can get DNA damage. And we know that there is this very uh, close association between varicoceles, high DNA damage, and infertility. And after the repair of the varicocele, where the testes cool down, the DNA damage decreases and fertility increases. Very different for women. They have all their eggs by the time they're born and the older they get, the older their eggs get. But you sper you're men, you're so lucky. You get new sperm every three, every three months. So you can, uh, you can make yourselves better with a little bit of uh, careful lifestyle change. And, and that's a really um, interesting fact, actually, because I've had somebody contact me who the next day their partner was giving a sample at the clinic for the IVF. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were the night before, obviously, both really nervous at home. Partner said he wanted to go to the gym. And they were both nervous about him going to the gym in case he did anything to damage the quality of the sperm. Um, and of course, the sperm that is actually ejaculated, as you say, was actually produced three months before. Yeah. It wouldn't yeah. damage the, you know, exercising the night before you give the sperm yeah. sample wouldn't oh. damage. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. And on that note as well, someone else has asked a question. Did you say 40 miles? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Sperm are amazing swimmers. That's what I think. You know, they're single-minded. They've got one job to do in life, and that is to swim to the egg and fertilize it. So they don't waste time doing other things. But boy, are they fit. That's why a man produces five, who can produce 500 million sperm per ejaculate, because loads of them can't swim. And so it's only, you know, it's only a few that really can swim all the way to the egg. Okay. What do you suggest? Now, this is a really good question. And I think this is a question for everybody, whether it's for people who are having um, treatment themselves or people like me that work in the industry and people like you um, doing research, mm -hmm. etc. Sheena. Mm -hmm. It says, what do you suggest we as the infertility community can do about the lack of information and research on male infertility? More of tonight? More yeah. of this sort of stuff? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for, for 20 years, I have been talking at conferences, I've been talking to the press, I've been doing research, I've been publishing papers, I've been speaking on behalf of the Science Media Centre. And I would have to say that over the last few years, I have seen changes. I really have. And the more we talk, everybody, it's up to all of us. And I know men sort of feel embarrassed and think that um, having a low sperm count or having a male fertility problem is associated with being less virile. That is not true at all. It's nothing to do with, with virility. Virility and fertility are not, not associated. So I think we all just need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. We need to um, tell everybody about it. And certainly the HFEA statistic last year has made men much more free to talk about it because they're not alone. It's a really fairly major problem and it's something that we haven't addressed at all. And I don't know if any of you ever read a, uh, something called Bio News. It's online. It's really more for professionals, but there are lots and lots of interesting articles there. And I wrote an article for it a, a few months ago saying I just thought men had been left out in the cold and it was time we looked after them properly. 
Um, another question that we often get asked is about mobile phones in pockets. And yeah. somebody here has said, you mentioned your Fitbit earlier, they in mobile phones admit EMF radiation. Yeah. Do you know if these radiations do, do affect sperm quality? There have been a, there have been a couple of papers um, talking about that. And certainly I wouldn't recommend that a man keeps his phone in his pocket right beside his, his testes all the time. Put it somewhere else. Put it in your hip pocket or even put it in your jacket. I mean, you know, what one swan doesn't make a summer and one research paper doesn't mean that it's absolutely true. But having said that, there is an indication that it's not good. So, and it's the same with laptops on your knee. Do it. Do something else. It's, it's easy to fix that one. Okay. Um, wh why are sometimes the results of sperm tests that, that are, you know, only taken a week apart? Why are the results so different sometimes? Yeah. The, the reproducibility of a semen analysis is very poor. Um, the, in the WHO guide, which is the one that we all go by when we're um, doing a semen analysis, um, has this lovely graph of a man's sperm count, of this man who produced two semen samples every week for about a year. He must have been exhausted. But if you look at them, you have high sperm counts, low sperm counts, it goes up and down like a heartbeat. There was nothing that was consistent about it. So this is absolutely true, and this, is, this was not, not as someone who had problems. So that is something that's natural, that you can have high and low, and that's not very helpful. And this is why sometimes if you have a low um, semen analysis or poor semen analysis, they ask you to come back for a second one, and then they take the average of the two. Okay, at, at one of the courses that I've attended about, um, well, well, that is supposed to support people who are trying to conceive, um, we were always told no binge bonking. <laughs> okay. Um, and one of the questions here is, is there a period of time that sperm need to recover between sexual activity with a male that has low sperm count, low motility, etc.? Well, for someone who has a low sperm count, yes, it's a good idea to abstain for two days or three days before you produce your sample, because obviously then you're going to have more sperm. But if it's unexplained infertility, then bunk, binge bonking or bunk binging is, is absolutely <laughs> fine. Is absolutely fine because there are actually now some uh, studies going on to show that short abstinence times are better for your DNA quality, for example, or for your motility. If you only wait for one day rather than two days before you produce your sample, that you've actually got better quality sperm. But that's not for someone with a low sperm count. If you have a low sperm count, or you think you might, or you've been told that you have in the past, then you should be waiting for between two and five days before you produce a sample for investigations because that maximizes your numbers. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So what would the next steps be if a sperm DNA fragmentation test came back with high damage um, the sperm has to be surgically extracted for our ICSI. Um, well, I, th I think there, there are a number of things you do before you do an extraction. Um, that's an invasive procedure. And whilst I've told you about it, um, you would need to have had a, a couple of fail cycles before with, with, with ejaculated sperm. You wouldn't go straight to doing that. That's your absolute last resort. So you'd be going for um, ordinary ICSI, first of all. You'd be going to see a urologist, you'd be checking out that you haven't got a varicocele or an infection, or there, you know, you can improve your diet, you could stop smoking, you could stop taking anabolic steroids, all of those things to see if you can improve your ejaculated sperm first. And then if nothing works and the only thing that's left to you is donor sperm or surgically retrieved sperm, then that's that's the, that's the time you make that decision. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Um, so I'm gonna make this the last question. So sorry if somebody has, I think I've, we've managed to cover the fair majority of them. Mm -hmm. So this last question, Sheena, my husband's been diagnosed with acispermia. Did I say that right? As acispermia, yeah, that's acispermia. no sperm. Mm -hmm. Hence our need for IVF with ICSI. Is this condition reversible? Would he ever be able to produce sperm in a future sample? Uh, I don't think there's much likelihood. There are two types of azospermia. 
One is an obstruction. I, I told you about the epididymis, this big long tube, and sometimes you can get a blockage in the tube. So you're producing lots of sperm, but they just can't get them out into the ejaculate. And that's when you can take a biopsy and get the sperm from the testes. The other type is non-obstructive, and that's because the sperm aren't being produced at all. And it's much more difficult to find sperm in that case, you know, for ICSI. But, you know, again, urologists are the people who can do all these things. It's becoming more and more commonplace to do them for fertility treatments now than it was five years ago. There are lots of research studies being shown now that it's, it's really a very successful way of getting sperm from, from men who have azospermia. So they have their own sperm used in ICSI and then their own child. Okay, thank you very much. Sheena, your answers have been very comprehensive and you've been willing to, to talk about lots and lots of different areas all to do with sperm and um, male factor infertility. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It really